Welcome, good morning to this sixth Sunday of Easter. Whether you're in person, I can count all of you on one hand, no, two hands, and on Zoom. Hello, Zoomers. Wave your hand, Zoomers. Yay. Okay, we just love to see you all, whether you are sitting in the pews here or on the screen. My name is Donna, and I am your liturgist for today. Okay, Zoomers, remember to keep yourselves muted until it's time to do the response. But when you do unmute, make sure that your room is quiet. We welcome today our beloved Deacon Ken to be here with us. And we thank him for bringing a message today. Okay, so we all know that May is AAPI Heritage Month. And here at church, what we are doing is we have a map at the back of the social hall. So we just ask that you place um, a pin on the map that shows where um, you or your ancestors came from. All right, so you can do that after service. Also, if you or your family and friends would like to donate for UMCOR, you can still do so until the end of May. So just please put UMCOR on the envelope, or you can make a check payable to UMCOR and write UMCOR on the memo line. All right. And what we're also doing now is if you'd like to donate money for altar flowers, please use the offering envelope again that's in the pews, and you can put your name on it and which Sunday that you want the flowers for. Okay, people, we have two dates that we want you to save. Welcome, George. Come on in. Okay, so on June 5th, we're going to celebrate Pentecost Sunday and our 135th anniversary. So we're going to be celebrating the coming of the Holy Spirit and giving thanksgiving and praise to God for our beloved community. It will be a joint service at 10 o'clock, so please extend this invitation to your family and friends and all past members. There will be a box lunch available after service for those who pay $10. You have the choice to stay and eat with others out in the courtyard or inside the annex. You may also take your lunch home. So please contact Peggy by next Sunday if you plan to join. The second save the date is June 19th, where we'll celebrate graduates and Father's Day. Go, so grow. Join our conference-wide prayer initiative to pray for the new church plants and the conference growth. Today, the new church start is Fresno Hispanic Latino. So please keep this new church start in your personal prayer time. All right, I invite you all to take a deep breath. Let's take it one more time, because I, I know some of you didn't, didn't do it. Let's take it one more time, okay. Please join me in the call to worship. Those on Zoom, if your room is quiet, please unmute yourselves to join. Dear beloved, God created us with love. Let the creator be home among us. In our hearts, may God be welcome. May God love, may God love every, every thought. May our actions lead to God's justice. May our words be a word to life. May God's Spirit lead us. May God's peace dwell within us. Amen. Amen. Friends, how was your week? How and where did you experience joys and blessings? Or was it difficult, but somehow you navigated through it. I pray that you can see that you are surrounded with the grace and love of our triune God at all times. Let us now join Becky and her family in singing our praise. Come join the dance of Trinity. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Lord God, the Almighty, you bless us with all that you have created. You open your heart to us and never close its door. We worship you. Jesus Christ, Lamb of God, you stand at the door, your hand on the knob, your coat over your arm, ready to go away. Yet you do not leave us trouble-hearted, but fill our emptiness with your peace. We praise you. Holy Spirit, God sent gift, you come to our defense when we are falsely accused. You rescue us from evil and sin and you comfort us when the nightmares of life keep us awake. We open our hearts to you. God in community, holy in one, your joy is our strength. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let us listen to the word of God. Our scripture reading this morning comes from John chapter 14, verses 23 to 29. Let us listen with our whole selves to what the Holy Spirit has to say to us today. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. Good morning, church. It's so good to be back here in person. This is my first time preaching live in two and a half years. But I I do have to say there were some things I loved about online worship. Uh, Not having to commute to church, for one, especially coming all the way up from San Jose. Uh, Getting to sleep in worshiping in my pajamas, 
<laughs> well, I, I can't do this one. Uh, making pancakes and eating them while listening to the sermon. Even if I was the preacher, uh, having a pre-recorded sermon, uh, get to get to do that. Uh, yet I have to say that uh, preaching online was was not my favorite. Um, when preaching online, uh, it's hard to get feedback. Uh, you don't get those laughs when a joke lands just the right way. Uh, you don't get those nods of understanding when a point has been well made. And the worst experience was recording my sermons. It is hard to deliver a sermon expressively and with enthusiasm without an audience present. I had to learn to resist the urge to start re-recording every single time I made a small slip of the tongue or a stutter or a stammer. And whenever it seemed I was finally getting a good take, uh, the maintenance workers in our condominium complex would show up and turn the leaf blowers on right towards the end of my message. So it is a relief to be back with you preaching live after two and a half years, even if I'm a little bit rusty. I'm relieved to preach uh, without the leaf blowers and the re-record button. Uh, and I am relieved to see your faces, uh, even if only above the nose, <laughs> uh, and to see those of you who are also here online uh, getting to enjoy those things that I enjoyed worshiping online uh, through the pandemic. Uh, and I'm relieved also to be able to share hugs again, although maybe we can do that uh, outside or, or near the door. The scripture passage we heard today is from the book of John, and it almost takes us back a few weeks in liturgical time. This passage is part of the farewell discourse, uh, which is a long sermon that Jesus gave to his disciples on Maundy Thursday, just after the Last Supper. It was to be his last night with the disciples, unnoticed to them, but known to Jesus, he was to be crucified the very next day. Parts of this sermon are famous. I remember hearing John chapter 14, verse 6, uh, which is before the, the passage that we heard today, uh, when I was in Sunday school growing up. Uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I never thought too hard about this passage until confirmation class, uh, which happened when I was in middle school, and my confirmation leader taught us that this passage meant that Jesus was the way, the one and only way to God and to experience salvation. Now, this caused some cognitive dissonance for me. Growing up, uh, my friends and classmates were of many different religious faiths, uh, they were Hindu, Muslim, uh, and those who were Christian were Catholic or Orthodox. We were one of only a handful of uh, Protestant or, or specifically Methodist families. I took this cultural and religious diversity for granted at the time. It felt normal. And what didn't feel normal was being in spaces where I was the only Asian kid in the room which unfortunately happened every Sunday. My parents took us to a big church in a nearby suburb that had a large traditional sanctuary with big stained glass windows, Gothic arches, and a big pipe organ. The space was beautiful, and the music and the worship were wonderful. Yet the social experience was different. I remember my mom saying once, when we had only been attending the church for a few years, I feel like I'm the only woman at this church who isn't blonde. <laughs> and those of you who have met my parents know that my mom is my white parent. People regularly uh, confused my parents with the other mixed race couple in the church, uh, a couple that also consisted of an Asian dad and a white mom. Luckily, their girls were much younger than me and my sister, so the church didn't have anyone to confuse us with. Uh, but that meant that I was the only Asian kid in my Sunday school classes. Uh, now, I think it's important to mention that there are people that I love and respect deeply at that congregation. 
But my experience there at the time wasn't one where I felt that I fully belonged. Uh, and yet, uh, when I went to school in this environment that was culturally and religiously diverse, uh, that was the space where I felt that I belonged. So when my confirmation leader taught us that Jesus is the only way to God and the only way to experience salvation, something felt a little bit off. I thought about my classmates who weren't Christian. I thought about how devoted they were to their own traditions and faiths. Did they, too, not know God? In my context at the time, where most of my classmates were white or Asian, this thought also had clear racial implications. If Jesus was the only, one and only way to God, uh, did that mean that my white classmates were saved, uh, along with some of my Korean classmates, who were Methodist? Uh, did that mean then that my, my, my brown classmates were doomed to hell. And uh, based on um, what he told our confirmation class, uh, that is indeed what my confirmation teacher believed, and, and certainly that is what many Christians believe. Uh, this belief is, was one of the ideas that animated uh, the European colonization of the American hemisphere and American exceptionalism and manifest destiny. The imperative to bring Christ to the unbaptized um, has served as a spiritual or religious justification for countless wars of conquest and, and other uh, injustices uh, that certainly don't seem uh, so Christian. My confirmation leader taught us that in order to access the one and only path to God, we needed to profess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But when you read this passage in full, Jesus doesn't actually say that. And here in the United Methodist Church, we do read passages in full, in spite of the uh, scripture cherry picking that my confirmation leader uh, was fond of. We in the United Methodist Church put scripture in context. We consider the whole and not just the parts. Uh, and that is why, uh, in spite of uh, what I'm sorry to say was a bad confirmation class, uh, I remained United Methodist, and why I love this church and this tradition, and why I decided to go to seminary and to pursue ordination. So Jesus does not say that you must profess my name in order to access God. Uh, instead, he says in verse 15, if you love me, keep my commands. And to make sure that the message isn't lost, he repeats this again in verse 23. Those who love me will keep my word. This statement reminds me of uh, another one of Jesus' statements in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, Not all who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Jesus is not saying that we are justified or saved through our actions, but he is saying that our actions reflect what is inside of us. And what Jesus wants from inside of us is our love. It is not our words, but our actions that demonstrate that love. Now, although I once took the religious diversity I grew up with for granted, I eventually learned, uh, unfortunately, that it was the exception and not the rule. Yet, more and more communities are looking like the one that I grew up in, and the community I grew up in is also becoming more diverse, uh, with more black and Latino families moving into the community. Fewer communities are as segregated and monoracial as they were in the last century, at least uh, in our major metropolitan areas, and more and more young people are growing up with uh, friends of different faiths. And uh, at the same time, fewer and fewer young people than ever are attending church. Now, I don't think that these things are unrelated. Perhaps young people are hearing messages like the one that my confirmation leader uh, shared. Uh, and perhaps they too have their doubts about the church. 
The church's claim to be the one and only path to salvation looks less and less true in an ever more pluralistic society. And all of this change, all of this greater diversity uh, has caused a lot of consternation in some circles. And now that I'm getting older, I even understand some of it. As more activities have resumed since the beginning of the pandemic, as people are spending more and more time in public, the world looks quite different than it did before, and that can be a little bit, uh, that can be an alienating experience. I noticed this in March and April, uh, when George and I spent two different weekends in Los Angeles. Uh, now, it had only been a few years since I was in LA, but uh, this time the city felt and looked noticeably different. For one, fashion has totally changed. Whereas for much of the last decade, Slim was in, now the looks are baggy again. The new look reminds me of when I was in middle school in the early 2000s, which was not a particularly happy time in my life. So this, this, the new baggy looks are, are uh, not styles that I feel particularly eager, eager to try. Not that I e could even pull off uh, what the young folks are wearing these days, which made me realize I'm, I'm getting old. <laughs> I'm now in my mid-30s, uh, I'm a millennial, and uh, my generation is no longer the generation that is setting the trends. Gen Z is now determining what's in, and, and what they want is different than what my generation wanted. So some of these changes in the world, especially these aesthetic changes and in the world of fashion, uh, are really making me feel my age. Other changes that I noticed while we were in Los Angeles seemed, um, unfortunately, less benign. While people were sheltering in place, it seems that many of the city's public spaces uh, were no longer being maintained. There was more trash and debris on the sidewalks, more graffiti in city plazas and in the subway stations. And while I don't have the statistics to back this up, it felt like there were even more unhoused folks than ever on the streets. Uh, we know that, that uh, homelessness is, has long been uh, something we see in our cities in California, uh, and yet the problem seems to be getting even worse. And those folks that we saw on the streets uh, appear to be dealing with even more severe mental health challenges than before the pandemic. And uh, in addition, uh, perhaps to assuage safety concerns, uh, of those who have the privilege of having homes, there were more police officers than I have ever seen on the streets of a major city on an ordinary day. Given all of the well-documented examples we have seen over the last several years uh, of the abuse of force that sometimes happens uh, with our, with our, our police uh, and the lack of accountability that often happens in these cases, I have to say that the police presence had me feeling even less safe. I do not understand how we have not learned that we cannot police our way out of a housing and mental health crisis that, it would seem, requires housing and treating people who live with mental illness. So it seems that the pandemic has widened the social and economic divides that already troubled us before the pandemic. It has accelerated trends that were already taking place, Changes that were happening slowly are now happening more quickly. Changes that were happening out of sight are now in full view. The world is less recognizable. It's, it can be disorienting and, and sometimes upsetting. I recently saw one of the best movies I've seen in a long time that spoke right to the heart of the chaos that is going on in the world right now. That movie is Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Please uh, raise your hand if you've seen the movie. On, on Zoom, you, you all can raise a hand too. <laughs> all right, so just a handful of us. Uh, I don't want to give any spoilers, uh, but I can share the premise. The main character, Evelyn, 
played by the venerable, fierce Michelle Yeoh, uh, is a Chinese immigrant in the Los Angeles area. She runs a laundromat with her husband. She is under tremendous stress as her business is being audited and her relationships with her husband, adult daughter, and elderly father are all precarious. Uh, breaking into this reality, uh, a visitor from a parallel universe shakes up her world, telling her that she and she alone can save the multiverse from destruction by connecting with alternate versions of herself in other universes. For me, the film represented what life feels like in the year 2022. It feels like we are living through everything, everywhere and all at once. A pandemic, war and the threat of war between major countries, climate change, everything is in flux. Time seems less linear and more fragmented. We search for historical parallels that might prepare us for this moment. We ask ourselves, uh, is, is this present moment like 1918, when a flu pandemic ravaged the world and the world uh, was at war? Or is this 1939, uh, with the invasion of a country in Europe? Are we on the verge of another major war in Europe? Is the United States entering a new Cold War with Russia and China? Are, are we heading back towards the 1960s? Or judging, back, uh, or, or judging by the latest trends in fashion, is it 1999 or maybe 2003 again? Uh, you could also just give up and say, as people have said over and over again, that we are living through unprecedented times. We are also living through extreme polarization that sort of feels like the fragmentation of reality. As we've been spending more and more time online uh, and less time with each other in person, uh, many people uh, have been vulnerable to disinformation on the internet. And uh, we've all been obtaining news from different sources. And it seems that our society can't even agree on what is real anymore. We each seem to be living in our own parallel realities and bubbles. The future seems less clear than ever. Where are we headed? It feels like there are infinite possibilities, yet none of them seem very good. It feels like we are all spinning around a big everything bagel of doom. And yet, in spite of its tremendous chaos, the movie Everything, Everywhere, All at Once had a positive, uplifting message. It suggests that we can find meaning in the mayhem. And even when everything seems to be in flux, some things ultimately remain the same. I can't say that the film offered a particularly religious message, but at the same time, as a seminary graduate and member of the clergy, I can't help but see everything through a theological lens. I see the uncertainty that was present throughout the film in our scripture reading today, for example. At the Last Supper, although Jesus knew what was coming to him, his crucifixion was inconceivable to his disciples. Wasn't Jesus, who was their teacher and their rabbi, also the Messiah? the one sent by God to redeem and restore the world? If the Son of God could be killed, was God even real? Did anything still matter in the world? You can imagine them asking these questions. They had followed him full time for three years. What would they even do without him? Well, Jesus had some answers. Sensing their anxiety and sensing what was to come, he said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. 
knowing that they feared losing him, he said, If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. Regarding what they would do without him, Jesus said, Those who love me will keep my word. And to reassure them that they would not be left alone, Jesus said, The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. In verse 15, Jesus assures his disciples that they will know the Spirit because it abides with you and in you. The church is in an uncertain time. It's shrinking. The church has long been shrinking, but the pandemic has made this trend worse across all denominations and traditions and most congregations. Younger generations are less religious and less religiously uh, interested or knowledgeable than ever. Uh, Even those of us who've been here for a long time and are are committed to the church, uh, I know many colleagues who are burnt out, some of whom have left ministry in the last two years. So uh, as we see uh, church attendance shrinking, as morale is low, it's tempting to ask the question, does what we do here even matter anymore? And when it feels like the world is spinning out of control, what can we even believe anymore? Jesus' words should reassure us. Jesus' crucifixion and death did not mean the death of God. God, who is the creator of all that is, everything, everywhere, all at once, is greater than we can ever imagine. The Holy Spirit, our advocate, is still with us in all situations and all realities. That is, in every possible universe. And so is Jesus in those who follow his commands, practice his teachings, and thereby demonstrate that they are filled with the love of Christ. As our world changes, and it will only continue to change as change is the only constant in life, God is still our companion. When all seems fractured and broken, even when it seems that we are living in the worst of all possible worlds, that world, too, is of God. God is still in this and every reality. Sometimes I think that in the church, we feel like everything depends on us. We remember the Great Commission, go and make disciples. Or, as we say in the United Methodist Church, go and make disciples for the transformation of the world. We think the salvation of the world uh, lies in our hands instead of God's, sometimes. Uh, And we might act like we are the the one and only way to God. And I want to assure us that what we do does matter to God. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. But we keep Jesus' commands not to make over the world in our image, according to our vision. We keep Jesus' commands because we keep the love of Jesus in our hearts. That's a love that can coexist with a world that makes no sense, one in which it seems that Everything is happening everywhere and all at once. It's a love that may even help keep us sane and grounded in a world where everything is happening everywhere all at once. To be here in church, keeping alive the memory of Jesus, is not about holding on to the one and only way, the way it's always been done, the way we've always done it. It's not about propping up a dying tradition it's not about participa- oh, it, it is about participating in a living tradition, a tradition that celebrates life, a tradition that intersects with our lives and the messy world that we live in. As the world changes, uh, as our church attendance uh, may shrink, what we do does matter, but maybe not in the ways that we're conditioned to think. We are called to be intersectional. We are called to be ecumenical. We are called to be interfaith. 
We are called to be less concerned with imposing our way on the world, but learning to roll with it and thrive. Even if that means that one day we wake up and everyone has hot dog fingers. Those of you who've seen the movie know what I'm talking about. In the midst of everything is God, everywhere and all at once. When all seems like chaos, when nothing feels familiar, when the future feels uncertain, the love of God is still with us and grounds us and keeps us sane. Thanks be to God. Amen. So, everything, everywhere, all at once, we know that the Holy Spirit is with us. So now we're going to go to our breakout rooms, and do we have the questions? Do you feel the Spirit present in your life, and how? What brings you peace when you are troubled or afraid? So let us now offer one another signs of peace by saying the peace of Christ be with you always. So those Zoomers, please unmute yourself. The peace of Christ be with you always. The peace of Christ be with you always. Yay. I, I think we lost some people. Oh, all right. Okay. Now we're coming down to prayers of the people. So you're invited to share any joys or concerns for yourself, your community, and God's world so that we might lift them up in common prayer. So those on Zoom, please unmute yourself, wave your, wave your hand so I can call on you. And after each person has named the prayer, let us respond with, Lord, hear our prayer. What happened to our Zoomers? Where are you? Becky, do you want to share prayer? Oh, they're back. Okay, good, good. Any, anybody on Zoom want to share anything? How about here in the pews? Oh, Becky, go ahead, Becky. Unmute yourself. Go ahead. Okay, well, I do thank God for um, two things, one for Ben and one for Ari. So Ari had her very wonderful concert last um, Saturday. And, you know, she had been practicing for months and months and months. And it was a very, very challenging piece. So I want to um, thank God that she, she did a wonderful job. Um, and, you know, it, it was just not easy. She actually was not feeling well that very week but it's sort of what you go through to do a, a concert piece of work like that. And for Ben, Ben challenged himself to do another double century, which is a 200 mile bike ride, which he <laughs> yesterday safely. So that was his second one this year. So I do want to praise God and thank God for um, seeing them through these challenges successfully. Lord, hear our prayers. Okay, I got the mic ready. Who wants to go ahead? Do you have something, Brenda? Okay. Um, I want to praise God for Deacon Ken and George who are here today, and it's so good to see you and you're healthy, and I, I do lift up prayers for George, Dr. George because he says it's so stressful when he goes to work. And we do pray for you, George, because you have a lot on your plate, keeping everyone healthy. And along those lines, I want to lift up um, healing prayers for Vince's sister, Janice, who has COVID. But praise the Lord, so far it's just a cough and achy uh, muscle. So pray that it doesn't get worse and 
Pray for our nephew who lives with her. And pray for all of us as we are not out of the pandemic, right, Dr. George? And we cannot let down our defense. And we pray for health for everyone to keep your masks on. And I know our anniversary is coming up on June 5th. Hope you all can come and pray that God will keep us all safe and healthy. And I do want to lift up all of you who went to the pilgrimage. Remember Atta? Well, Atta's twin brother, Fami, is now back in Wadi Fokin. He lives in Toronto, and he's visiting his home village. Pray for protection for him because they are faced with so much trouble daily. He says it's a daily thing. They wake up with fear that someone's going to come and kick them out of their land. So pray for Wadi Fokin. Continue praying. And thanks for the resolution that was passed by the Friends of Wadi Fokin in the annual conference. And it was passed um, almost unanimously to support Wadi Fokin and to bring awareness to the demolition of the olive, olive trees there. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Anybody else? Tony. They both welcome back to this both this both this year and the both welcome back to both of you. I'm glad you came a long time to see you in the trip in Canada. You both of the gentlemen good help the good help feeling much better and the God bless America. A tradition you vote in you. And we're glad to see you last week and on this Sunday traditional and the God the feel so much much better and the God less anaga. Yes. Lord, hear our prayer. Anybody else? So I have a few on the list. Okay, so we want to lift up um, healing prayers for Laura's not feeling good today. She's at home. Um, we also want to lift up healing prayers for uh, Pastor William, because um, Pastor Maynard shared with us that he had some dental work done. So, he, so we need healing prayers for him. And let's see, uh, traveling mercies for Adrian and Richard, who are still back east visiting their granddaughter. Let's see, who else is on the list? Oh. Just pray that uh, Peggy and Larry are having a good time. Their daughter is in town. And Rick's with them this weekend. Uh, let's see. Anything else? Anybody else? So, Lord, hear our prayers. Now, let us lift our hearts to lift up our prayers for the well-being of all people. Let us pray. God of mercy and justice, the two recent hate shootings remind us once again that our world can be violent and unjust at times. Our prayers and thoughts are with the families and loved ones of those who lost their lives in this tragedy. We also pray for mental wellness and recovery of the three people who survived the shootings. Holy God, on this day, we weep with you. We weep with the families who have lost loved ones to the ongoing epidemic of gun violence. We weep with the communities of Buffalo and Laguna Woods. We weep with our Latino neighbors who are being targeted. We weep because such occurrences have become commonplace in our time. Hear our cry, O oh God. With you, God, we condemn the hatred that has fueled such violent action. We condemn the racism, nationalism, and bigotry, cultural or political, that lies at the root. We lament and confess our silence and complicity in the face of such things. We lament that these sentiments have been stirred by the highest office in the land. And we pray that you would grant repentance from the halls of power all the way to our very own hearts, that we may reflect your image in our humanity. May your kingdom come, Lord Jesus. Make us instruments of your peace, Holy Spirit. Help us to actively and courageously address any prejudice, discrimination, or racism 
that occurs in our spheres of influence. Through intentional dialogue, listening to the experiences of others and calling out hate, we can contribute to the healing and growth within our communities. Lord, lead us forward. Lord, lead us toward hope when it is hard for us to see it. Lead us to love our neighbors through concrete action and ordinary faithfulness in everyday life. Lead us to raise our voices for those under assault. Lead us to lovingly welcome immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers, and all whom you bring into our midst. Lead us to co-labor with you in the work of new creation right here where we are. As we pray, we remember those in our community who are elderly and live alone. We ask for your presence and help be with them, especially in the sleepless nights and in their physical pain. We remember the three faithful and diligent sisters and brothers who spend time and energy to teach English to those first-generation immigrant friends. We give thanks to you for the community as we are about to celebrate our 135th anniversary. Remind us it is your love that enables us to love one another and serve your people, and that we will always be faithful to you and continue to witness your love to others. We pray all these in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Now let us pray the Lord's Prayer together in unison. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our God does not give as the world gives. In the chaos, God is our peace. In our fear, God is our confidence. In our weakness, God is our strength. So let us now offer our gifts to God for the work of mercy. So you can come forward to place your gift in the plate here at the front and use a side aisle to get back to your seat. Or you can just come up and touch the plate as an offering of yourself. Okay, for those of you on Zoom, I invite you to lift up your hands as a sign to offer your gifts. Let us pray. May these gifts be used to build the beloved community through our hands of service. In the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. Okay, folks, now I invite you to join Peggy in singing our closing hymn, Creation Sings. Creation sings and we are in the music, the movement of God's energy and art, a liturgy that links our life to angels, a litany that rises from the heart. 
Deacon can to give us the benediction. Friends, I remember this message. In the midst of everything is God, everywhere and all at once. When all seems like chaos, when nothing feels familiar, when the future feels uncertain, the love of God is with us, grounds us, and keeps us well. Thanks be to God. Go in peace. Amen.